Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Square Pattern Blogs in London and elsewhere. My name is David Wincup. This is the third of our series on whistleblowing, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, we are going to talk about the impact of the whistleblowing directive in Italy, Spain and key jurisdictions in Central Europe. Uh, we are going to record this, uh, so a recording will be available if you would like. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, there will also be a Q&A function in, um, don't ask me where, I can't make these things work, but there is a Q&A function. Uh, if you have a question, please do put it in. And if we have time, we will get to it. If we don't have time, then look out for an answer to it in the Squires employment blog over the over the coming weeks. Now we're going to talk today about, um, as I say, these three jurisdictions. This is a good time to talk about European whistleblowing landscape because most of the member states are in the middle of or have finished or are somewhere near introducing the domestic legislation consequent on the whistleblowing directive. And that means for the first time that for a business headquartered in the US or the UK, but you have operations in continental Europe, then it for the first time it isn't going to be good enough simply to take your UK US whistleblowing policy and change the badging. Uh, that that those days have gone. The directive is very prescriptive around procedures to be used, covers a very wide range of potential whistleblowers. Our second webinar in this series went into more detail about that, so uh, you can get hold of the recording of that if you want a bit more detail of it. But these points essentially highlight the difference between how whistleblowers are seen in the UK and how they're seen in Europe. There's a, a view in the UK that whistleblowers are a sort of necessary evil uh, to be tolerated, but nothing more. Our whistleblowing legislation is entirely reactive in the sense that there are no obligations to go through particular channels, no obligations on the employer as to the timing or fact or detail of feedback. There's not much scope to go outside uh, the business. There's no obligation to tell the employee what happened. The only issue at the core of this is that the employee should not be retaliated against. Uh, so it would be completely lawful in most cases for an employer to receive a protected disclosure and do absolutely nothing about it at all. By contrast, the European directive sees whistleblowers as very much a force for good and to be encouraged in the fight against terrorism and tax fraud and corruption, nuclear safety and so on. And that's perhaps difficult to argue with. The obligations are many and varied, as we will hear. Uh, so we've gone through this directive. We've gone from the UK having some of the more sophisticated whistleblowing legislation in Europe to it's having some of the least sophisticated whistleblowing in Europe. Now, to help us understand whether that's a good idea or not, I'm joined by colleagues from other offices who are going to talk about that. Uh, so um, here is our cast of thousands. Elsa is uh, counsel in Milan, Nacho Rigojo, partner in Madrid, and Yaroslav Tiber is counsel in Prague. We're going to go in that order uh, through those jurisdictions. Yaroslav has very bravely agreed to take on the Slo Slovak Republic and Poland as well, so top marks for him. Uh, and we will go from there. So the first thing to do, I'm going to do, is hand over to Elsa to talk about the position in Italy. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin with a very brief overview of uh, uh, the Italian legislation on whistleblowing before the implementation of the new European Directive. 
Indeed, uh, whistleblowing in Italy is not new. Uh, for a long time, uh, uh, the regulation of whistleblowing related only to civil servants and employees uh, in financial institutions. In uh, uh, 2017, uh, there was a reform uh, uh, that uh, uh, regarded uh, uh, public administration, but also the private sector, basically Looking at the private sector, uh, this reform uh, introduced uh, the obligation to put in place uh, with the blowing procedures and policy for those companies adopting the so-called uh, 2 pre one model. Basically, according to Italian law, this model is a complex uh, compliance program uh, that companies can adopt uh, to prevent the commissions of certain offenses and crimes. It's not mandatory, but usually it's adopted as a strategic choice because it could exclude the criminal uh, liability of the company in case of uh, offenses committed by its employees or representative in the, in, in the interest and to the advantage of the same company. So this previous regulation already pro provided for protections for um, whistleblowers and for the obligation to establish uh, uh, communication channels. The confidentiality of the whistleblower was protected and of course uh, he was protected also against any kind of retaliation. But of course uh, uh, the scope of application of this regulation was limited to those companies applying this model. Uh, coming at uh, the new coming to the new uh, reform uh, very recent reform in Italy concerning whistleblowing uh, that implemented the European directive uh, as uh, probably some of you will already know uh, in March 2023 Italy uh, published in the official journal a new legislative decree uh, implementing the European Directive uh, uh, protecting uh, the whistleblowers. This new regulation uh, will enter into force uh, uh, from 15 July 2023, uh, with the exception of companies uh, uh, with a number of employees up to 249 that will be obliged to implement the new uh, um, internal reporting channels only from 17 December 2023. So what are the obligations on companies uh, to implement uh, internal whistleblowing channels? First of all, uh, we should look at uh, which are the companies obliged to comply with these new obligations. Indeed, uh, the legislative decree extended the scope of application uh, of uh, the previous regulation. So basically, uh, the companies uh, in the private sector um, concerned by this new legislation are the companies with more than 50 employees uh, in the last uh, from 50 or more employees uh, in the last year. Of course, the companies that apply the 2 3 one model are still obliged to implement uh, the whistleblowing regulation according to the new provisions. And uh, this regulation covers also companies uh, uh, that fall under the scope of application of specific European regulation concerning certain sectors. For, so, for example, financial sector, safety and transport uh, sector, protection of environment, anti-money laundering, and so on. Uh, as we said before, the companies uh, with up to 249 employees will have until 17 December 2023 to establish the new reporting channels. But let's see now uh, what are these obligations that uh, the companies should comply with. So, first of all, uh, the new legislative decree requires the company to establish external, but also internal channels to uh, file uh, specific reports 
by the whistleblower. The whistleblower is basically a person who discloses information uh, acquired in the context of the employment uh, environment. But a whistleblower can be considered also a person that uh, has not yet been hired, but uh, during the recruitment process learned certain violation or a person that uh, uh, already left uh, the job position, but during the working uh, relationship period uh, became aware of certain violations. So uh, companies uh, should establish First of all, these internal reporting channels. Um, before implementing those channels, companies are required to inform a consult, works council, if any, and the trade union association. Uh, it's not mandatory to reach an agreement with them, but uh, it's, it's mandatory to uh, implement this prior information and consultation. Uh, these uh, uh, Internal reporting channel basically can be uh, managed by a person or uh, an autonomous department internal to the company. Also by a third party as alternative, provided that in all these uh, cases, the personnel in, uh, employed therein is specifically trained and qualified to deal with this kind of duty. Uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, an obligation uh, for this uh, report, um, this department to follow a specific procedure uh, once uh, a report has been filed. Uh, put simply, once uh, a, report is a report is made, uh, the department should, within the following seven days, um, acknowledge uh, the receipt of this report. After that, there should be an interaction with the whistleblower in order to acquire the needed information. And within the following three months, uh, it is necessary uh, to give a feedback to the reporting person. The person who files the report uh, should be able to do it in, in writing or orally through, uh, for example, phone hotlines or a message system, or also even asking a one-to-one -one meeting. And the confidentiality of the identity of this person uh, should be protected. It's uh, uh, under an employment perspective important to bear in mind that in the context of disciplinary procedures, it's not possible to mention the name of the whistleblower unless uh, the whistle, uh, this is essential for uh, the validity of the same disciplinary procedure. But uh, I would say, unfortunately, even if uh, it is essential to mention the name of the whistleblower without uh, the consent of this person, the name cannot be mentioned. So this uh, kind of obligation that, of course, is very important to protect whistleblowers could pose some issues uh, uh, in respect of uh, the successful um, uh, um, carrying out of the disciplinary procedure itself. It's uh, uh, good to know that within group companies, uh, provided that uh, no more than 249 employees uh, are employed, the internal reporting channel can also be shared uh, between the different companies that can also share the resources to manage these uh, uh, reports. So uh, let's see uh, which kind of matter can be reported. Uh, basically, uh, the matters that can be reported should be a violation of domestic or European law regulation that could harm the public interest or the integrity or uh, the private entity, provided that, let's say, as we said, uh, the reporting person became aware of such issues uh, in the context of the work uh, performance. 
In respect of anonymous reports, the uh, legislative decree does not uh, take a specific position, but uh, we would suggest uh, to uh, facilitate also anonymous reporting because, of course, uh, we can imagine that sometimes people are uh, afraid to uh, file reports uh, and so uh, letting them to do uh, the report in an anonymous way could uh, uh, feel uh, uh, the people uh, more comfortable in uh, uh, raising specific issues. As we said before, uh, this new legislation provided an obligation for both public administration, but also the private companies to provide also external uh, channel for filing the reports. Uh, the body identified by the decree to uh, collect this external um, uh, this, uh, external report is the anti-Italian anti-corruption authority. But uh, it is uh, worth noting that uh, not everything can be reported to the uh, Italian anti-corruption authority and uh, this can be done in any case only in specific circumstances. So first of all, it is possible uh, to report only breaches of European regulations. And secondly, uh, with reference to uh, the private sector, the whistleblower can resort to the Italian Anti-Corruption Authority only if uh, previously filed a report according to uh, the internal uh, channel, but uh, the report uh, has not been responded or whether the whistleblower believes, uh, has reasonable grounds to believe that there could be a retaliation if he files the report internally, or whether they believe that uh, uh, always on reasonable grounds that uh, uh, there could be an immediate danger to the public interest if they don't file immediately uh, the report to the anti-corruption authority. We have a similar regulation in case of public uh, disclosure. Uh, public disclosure is protected by this new reform, but again, not in any circumstances. So uh, the person who publicly disclose an information is protected. Uh, again, provided that uh, first uh, they try to file the report internally, but the report did not have a um, a response or uh, it was not followed up or uh, whether the whistleblower again be, is afraid of retaliation or believes that there could be a uh, immediate danger for the entity and for the public interest if they don't talk. This new regulation provides also of course uh, a lot of protections for the whistleblowers and this is basically the main uh, sense of all the European directive. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the protection is not so different from the past. So, of course, the whistleblower is protected for any kind of, from any kind of retaliation. And so any kind of contact conduct uh, aimed at uh, discriminating or uh, putting in place retaliation against the whistleblower is null and void. Um, The dismissal implementing for the reasons would, would be null and void. Uh, and there is also a presumption that if the whistleblower if, uh, is subject to a specific conduct right after the reporting, uh, this conduct is due to the reporting per se. This new legislative decree provided high and severe sanction in case of violation of the whistleblowing regulation. So basically, uh, there will be these fines up to 50,000 euro. Uh, the fine will range from 10,000 up to 50,000 in different cases. First of all, in case of retaliation against the whistleblower. 
Secondly, if uh, somebody tries to prevent the whistleblower from filing the report, and uh, thirdly, if the reporting channels are not put in place, and uh, of course, uh, if uh, um, there is a sort of discrimination after the reporting has been filed. Also, the whistleblower could be punished, but with a lower sanction if he files a report uh, not in good faith. And in that case, uh, the sanction will be up to 2,000 euro. So, in conclusion, uh, it's important that uh, uh, companies that do not have in place uh, a whistleblowing uh, procedure, but uh, um they are uh they fall under the scope of application of this regulation uh established the new these uh, reporting channels and it is also important that companies that already have the whistleblowing regulation uh, checked to be in compliance with the new regulation so for italy it's uh, um all and uh, I leave the floor to Nacho for Spain. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thank you all for joining this webinar. And I'm uh, more than happy to speak uh, with you all about uh, the current position about the uh, whistleblowing uh, directive implementation in Spain. The answer to the first question is yes. Spain has introduced legislation to implement the whistleblowing directive. This uh, was published in the official gazette on the, the uh, 21st of February this year, and uh, it came into force on the 13th of March. <clears throat> that means, of course, that uh, currently is enforceable. <clears throat> excuse me, and applicable. The uh, um, situation uh, in connection with the deadlines to uh, apply and implement the uh, whistleblowing channels or what, how it is called here in Spain according to the new uh, act regulating the whistleblowing is the internal information system and uh, as uh, we can see and in line with the directive um, all companies having 50 or more employees are obliged to establish this internal whistleblowing channels or the internal information system as we call that in in spain this uh, in connection with the private sector um, is formerly there was the obligation to uh, have this type of uh, whistleblowing policy uh, according to uh, the European Union legislation on financial services or products and, and uh, prevention of money laundering and terrorist financing. But nowadays is not only that. The Spanish law also applies to include political parties, trade unions, employers, organizations, and foundations uh, set by any of these. Um, for private sector companies uh, that have 250 or more employees, the deadline was 13th of June. So, it was a very short timeline to implement this directive. We have been working with uh, a number of clients to set up this internal uh, information system in Spain. And as, I, as David pointed out uh, in the beginning of this webinar, unfortunately, is not uh, as simple as changing the names and applying the UK or US uh, existing or uh, well, regulations that companies may have in other jurisdictions. The, as we will see shortly, the Spanish 
legislation adopts and expands the um, indications and the regulations of the European Directive. Uh, just uh, uh, to note, the deadline for companies having less than 250 employees, the uh, deadline to implement and have this system in place is extended up to the 1st of December this year. Um, just uh, to note as well, in line with the provisions of the directive, legal entities that uh, have less than 250 employees may share this internal reporting channels. Um, in connection, not with the implementation, but with the management of the internal, internal information system, this can be outsourced by, uh, by the company or group of companies in Spain to a external third party. And also uh, group companies in Spain uh, can establish this uh, internal information system for all the group companies uh, but this is uh, the group of companies choice. They can have one single internal information system, as I said, for the whole group or the different group entities can implement an, um, a, a, an uh, internal information system. Um, I want to highlight Again, well, in this sense, even if we will address briefly this reference later, is that we are constantly referring to this internal uh, system, but the law foresees a, an external um, system which is uh, governed and managed by the external authority. That is to say, on top of any and all internal whistleblowing channel, there is already set, uh, if I may rephrase that, because it is not already set, the law foresees a external authority for this purpose, but uh, being honest, is not yet implemented. It will be soon uh, established, hopefully, because uh, one of the particularities of the Spanish system is that companies that need, or group of companies that need to implement this internal system must appoint a person in charge of the system what we refer to the system manager and this person the name and uh, contact details has to has to be provided uh, to this external authority but we do not have yet the details of this uh, external authority but just to let you know that this uh, is in place and this is um uh, it, this is ongoing. Um, I let me just go forward, and uh, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, it is key, and it is not as simple as changing the name in any other um, uh, existing whistleblowing regulation or any other integrity or speak out policy is is not unfortunately as simple as that why is this because the spanish legislation um further to what david pointed out at the beginning is not only 
um, uh, something that we will have to bear with and uh, observe. It is more than that. The Spanish legislation is more or less an invitation to disclose to almost anyone, as we will see uh, a bit later, any type of uh, infringements in the uh, Spanish uh, legal environment, if I may say. Um, I do not want to be excessively uh, alert in this, in this sense, but I do want to bring attention to all the participants because this may bring some uh, potential concerns to companies, as we will see shortly. First point, the body responsible for the implementation is the governing body of the legal entity. And by this, of course, I refer to the directors and the members of the board. They will be responsible for the implementation of this uh, policy and uh, whistleblowing regulation. And as uh, also as Elsa mentioned for the case in Italy, it is key to consult before the implementation of any policy to consult with the workers' representatives if any has been have been uh, appointed already. Uh, as in the Italian case, there is no need to reach an agreement with the workers' representatives, but it is uh, compulsory to consult with them. Um, the essential aspects of Spanish regulations is, as I mentioned, to enable all persons to report almost any breaches detected. And uh, when I refer to all persons, the Spanish um, legislation refers to employees, also as the Italian case, to candidates or former employees, but also, and this is important, to any self-employees or contractors that are rendering services for the company. And not only that, uh, this channel must be open, that would be uh, assumed, to board members, but also, uh, board members and executives, but also to shareholders. And that is, uh, of course, key. Um, one of the additional uh, requirements, and this is very much in line with the directive, but uh, our, lay, our law goes even beyond that, to ensure confidentiality. Um, in Spain, as uh, in Italy, as mentioned by Elsa, the reports can be uh, filed in writing or verbally, and uh, working with clients, how can we have verbal, uh, uh, because the reports in Spain have to be recorded and all of them have to be um, listed in a, an internal bookkeeping sort of record. Those, all these reports have to be recorded. And how do we record verbal reports? In practical terms, what we usually suggest is uh, to have, of course, there could be a person to record and trans, well, not translate, but to put in writing this verbal reports or complaints, but also a good solution could be that the uh, telephone number which is accessible in the system uh, could be a self-recording 
method. This could enab enable and facilitate whistleblowers, which is the aim of the uh, Spanish regulation, to facilitate all these reports having an anonymous telephone number where they can automatically report their concerns. And by having <clears throat> an anonymous reception of these verbal reports could facilitate the uh, whistleblowing report. Um, another thing that is uh, specific to Spanish regulations is the need to integrate the different internal information channels. Um, it is easy to say, but from the technical data protection and policy requirements is not always that easy. But of course, we're more than happy, we're experienced, and we can assist our clients to comply with the Spanish regulations and integrate all these internal information channels. What uh, we find also um, well, the, the guarantee to effectiveness of communications is in line what uh, the procedures are set in the, um, in the directive. There is also the need to effective communications and uh, as mentioned already, uh, there is the need to acknowledge uh, the reception of an initial report in the following seven days from um, the issue of this report. There is also the need to communicate to the reporter uh, within the deadline of three months what the situation or even the outcome of that report is, uh, is provided with the exception on uh, particularly complex situations that the initial three months period could be extended for an additional three months, having a total of three months, uh, six months investigation. The independence and differentiation of the channel referred to whistleblowing is in practical terms also a channel, uh, so, sorry, uh, a challenge to implement the uh, Spanish regulation. Because as we said just two points above, there is the need to integrate the internal information channels and as well to guarantee that the whistleblowing channel is uh, addressed and managed in an independent and different way of proceeding. So this is, uh, is not always easy and uh, there is uh, some work to achieve this. Of course, uh, a key point in Spain is also uh, to guarantee the protection of informants. Um, what matters can be reported on? Uh, the law in Spain has extended effects and this could be difficult or challenging for Spanish uh, uh, companies. Why is this? Because not only um, the, the reports can be made on the infringements in connection with European law. As we know, the financial services, the product safety, transport safety, food and, and uh, feed safety, and also important, privacy and personal data and uh, security of networks. This is clear, this is key and risky 
for many companies, but as you can see here in Spain, the whistle blowing channel is open for serious or very, well, criminal are always serious. And these criminal uh, infringements can be made uh, and can be reported internally. Whatever criminal offense the reported may think of. And also administrative offenses that are serious or very serious. And uh, that includes, includes um, uh, matters as open as any health and safety breaches at work. And not only that, any breaches that include any financial loss to public treasury, which is tax, and social security, as well as health and safety. So the channel in Spain is wide open, not only to a number of potential reporters, including, as I mentioned earlier, contractors, uh, um, uh, contractors, uh, shareholders, and many other people. So this is uh, an area that needs to be um, very, uh, very well addressed and not as simple as changing the names on existing policies. Um, uh, are, are companies uh, required to follow up anonymous reports? Yes, absolutely yes. And the uh, one of the key areas is that reporters that have uh, decided not to reveal their identity must be preserved to the maximum potential extent, maximum possible extent. And this in practical terms, and uh, particularly in connection with, um, with um, um, investigations, this is sometimes not easy to achieve because many of us have experience on reports referring to situations where only two individuals were present and it is very difficult to balance the right of the whistleblower to preserve their identity with the right of the reported person to have the right to a full and uh, defense because most likely he or she will say if I do not know who reported this I do not have sufficient grounds to build a, a, a correct defense of my fundamental rights. Um, uh, going to the next question, uh, yes, whistleblowers can make external reports. And in the Spanish policy, there is a need to make reference to the right of any whistleblower to report to this independent whistleblowing, whistleblowing, blue whistleblower, sorry, protection authority. Um, what about public disclosures? Yes, um, a, any, uh, and the law, which being honest, it is not the best piece of legislation that I have ever seen because there are a number of gray areas. And uh, to be honest, some inaccuracies, because just as an example, 
the reference to the law in connection with data protection responsibilities, making responsible to the treatment of data protection to the governing body of the company had to be corrected by a new interpretation of uh, our the Spanish Data Protection Agency. So I do not want to go into detail, but uh, just to share with you my frustration, personal frustration, to the uh, quality of the Spanish regulation. But yes, uh, uh, reporters can go to the media if they honestly believe that uh, the uh, first of all, they uh, have the right, and this is based on the right constitutionally accepted and protected, which is the right to free speech. And if they provide truthful information, they they can disclose this any wrongdoing to the media. But in any case. Uh, there must be uh, truth uh, information and the conviction that the uh, independent whistleblowing protection authority or the internal whistleblowing report will not uh, be effective. But that is, of course, a subjective conviction. There is not a legal limit to make this. So, going uh, uh, to the media and making a public disclosure, uh, companies, if that is the case, may have limited protection. The protection for whistleblowers and um, concern about time, uh, yes, in line with the protection with the um, with the directive. Uh, there is a protection against retaliation and of course the um, reported breaches and individuals have to believe that the information is true and uh, they have to report according to the law as uh, i mentioned before this protection extends to third parties who are entitled to report uh, whistleblower, and this includes, as I mentioned, shareholders, uh, candidates, former employees, and any of those individuals who are entitled to report, and uh, they cannot suffer from retaliation. As uh, mentioned by uh, Italy in, in, in before, which is very relevant, and as opposed to in my view, UK or uh, US Anglo-Saxon regulations, there is the presumption that if an employee or any reported suffers any type of um, decision against his or her interest, that is presumed to be a retaliation. And the company or the, um, uh, yes, the company basically will uh, be free of liability if the company can prove that this decision not to contract to uh, change terms and conditions of employment or any decision is made excluding any uh, link to the uh, report made but by this by this uh, by this individual the sanctions for companies in case of not compliance are minor serious and very serious uh, depending on the circumstances but be aware that are significant and uh, material and could be up to 1 million euros and uh, the statute of limitations uh, are six months uh, for serious two years and very serious three years. And uh, 
I believe this is all from Spain and uh, and I leave the the room for uh, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic and uh, Poland. Thank you and uh, very good morning to all. Thank you. Bye. Good afternoon, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Here's Czech Republic, Slovakia and Poland all together. It is a pleasure for me to walk you through the whistleblowing situation uh, in these selected sea countries, uh, in particular in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, I will also supply some uh, basic information on implementation status in Poland uh, uh, in the end. Uh, first, uh, please let me go through some general comments related to both the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, after that, we will have a look into some comparisons between um, these two countries uh, related to several specific aspects. Uh, I will not go into the detail as my colleagues, since I will try to cover for more countries at once. And uh, also, uh, as you can see, we may be uh, running out of time, so I will attempt to be uh, brief. Uh, quick but comprehensive at the same, at the same time. Uh, finally, I am going to skip to Poland, uh, but uh, don't be afraid, it will be quite a short story for the reason I will explain in the end. So in the first slide, uh, for the Czech Republic and Slovakia, both um, in relation to the implementation status, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, we had no explicit legislation on protection of whistleblowers until now. So this is completely new to Czech employers, uh, meaning that they should really prepare. Uh, the final version of the Czech Whistleblowing Act has been uh, very recently passed by the Czech Parliament. So we are here just on time. Uh, so we already uh, have the final wording of the act and the new law uh, will come into force as of August 1st, which means we have 30 days uh, or 30 plus days now. Uh, however, uh, companies with between 50 and 249 employees uh, have an extended period to comply, uh, which would be until 15th of December of this year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Slovak Whistleblowing Act was adopted already back in uh, 2019. Uh, the Slovak uh, Act already reflected all key requirements uh, covered by the directive uh, uh, at that time. So uh, the current amendments to the Act uh, uh, are uh, rather cosmetical or not that significant. Uh, they were adopted in May of this year, and these new changes uh, will come into force uh, in two stages, on the 1st of July, which is two days from now, and on the 1st of September. So again, there's a scaling uh, in effectiveness of this new law. Um, so let me uh, have a look. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, now. Uh, as of August 1st, uh, employers with at least 50 employees will be subject to the new law. Uh, but as I said, uh, businesses with between 50 and 249 employees will have to comply only by December of this year. Uh, under the new Czech law, uh, employers are in particular required to establish internal whistleblowing channels. These channels are subject to some specific uh, and quite many uh, requirements, uh, such as allowing different options of reporting. Uh, quite importantly, the Czech law explicitly dictates the employers to accept reports in person. And there are some discussions now, and there is no clear interpretation yet on whether this will need to be done like one-to-one uh, -one or face-to-face -face meeting, or also some remote communication channels uh, will be allowed, such as Teams or FaceTime or something like uh, that. Uh, under the 
check law, the time limit for responding uh, to whistleblowing reports is 30 days, which is significantly shorter than the three month time limit uh, set out in the directive. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is an option for this period to be ex extended twice, uh, up to 30 days each time. Uh, such an extension, uh, however, each time should be well justified. Uh, on sharing uh, the reporting channel, uh, Czech companies with fewer than 250 employees can share internal reporting channels. However, bigger employers must, must set up their own reporting channels regardless of whether they are part of a company's group or not. Uh, the same uh, topic for Slovakia. Uh, in Slovakia, uh, companies with at least 50 employees are already now obliged to establish an internal reporting system. Uh, under the existing law, as I mentioned, uh, but as of 1st September of this year, employers providing financial services, transport security services, and environmental services uh, will have to establish an internal reporting system regardless of the number of their employees. So uh, in some instances, there may be a situation that the company has one or two employees and it will have to establish an internal reporting system. Uh, on the shared reporting in Slovakia, uh, Slovak employers with less than 250 employees may share group-wide reporting channels, uh, which is the same situation as in the Czech Republic. And now for some comparisons, as I promised. Uh, uh, on this slide, you can see a basic comparison between Slovakia and the Czech Republic in some uh, specific areas, namely scope of reporting uh, and whether anonymous reports can be made. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, the scope of the reporting. So uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, the whistleblowers are specifically protected when reporting on any criminal offenses and certain administrative uh, offenses in, in addition to the uh, European uh, legislation breaches. Uh, in the Slovak republics, uh, in the Slovak Republic, uh, uh, basically uh, it is the same. Uh, in addition to breaches of EU law, uh, the scope of reportable legal breaches includes also criminal offenses specified by the Slovak law, as well as some selected, more serious, let's say, criminal and administrative offenses. So on anonymous reporting, uh, and I think this is quite interesting, uh, there is a difference between these two countries and also a difference between uh, the Czech Republic and many other countries in the, in the EU. Uh, anonymous reports cannot be made in the Czech Republic, or more precisely, uh, they can be made, but will not be anyhow covered by the regime of the whistleblowing legislation. Uh, this means that in the Czech Republic, an anonymous whistleblower will not be protected and Czech employers do not have to follow up on anonymous reports. On the other hand, uh, companies in Slovakia uh, are also required to follow up on anonymous reports. So the law here uh, fully impacts on anonymous whistleblowers too. Uh, again, uh, on this slide, uh, you can see comparison of the two countries are related to external reporting, public disclosures, and retali retaliation prevention. 
Uh, not much difference here between uh, these two countries. Both countries are very similar. Uh, Czech law allows external reporting, which would be done through the Czech Ministry of Justice. Importantly, whistleblowers can make an external report without prior internal report. Uh, in the Czech Republic, whistleblowers can also go public with their complaints, but if they publicly disclose, they will only gain protection in certain specific restricted circumstances as per the EU directive. Uh, in Slovakia, whistleblowers can make external reports uh, to either a prosecutor in relation to criminal uh, offences or to the competent, uh, com competent administrative authority in case of administ administrative offences which are covered by, by the law. Uh, if this, these bodies subsequent, subsequently decide that the individual made a qualified report, uh, they will provide protection to them and inform the employer. The whistleblower protection office, which is special uh, body established uh, under this uh, law, and to the respective individual. Uh, Again, in Slovakia, whistleblowers who publicly disclose information will only gain protection in certain limited circumstances. Finally, uh, under Czech law as a directive, employers are not allowed to, to retaliate. Whistleblowers who suffer retaliation may subsequently claim compensation in respect of both financial and non-financial damages. Uh, whistleblowers are similarly protected in Slovakia as well. Uh, from the moment the employer is informed of the status of the employee as a protected whistleblower, the employer may not take any action against the employee without the prior consent of the whistleblower protection office. Uh, now comes uh, a comparison of sanctions to be possibly imposed in both countries uh, for non-compliance. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, companies do, which do not comply with the law may face fines of up to Euro for 40k uh, or up to Euro 16k for less significant breaches. Uh, what is quite important and interesting uh, individuals within the company who are responsible for receiving and handling whistleblowing reports, uh, i.e. whistleblowing officers, may be held personally responsible and may be sanctioned by up to Euro 4,000 for breaching their obligations. Uh, some even more significant sanctions can be imposed in Slovakia for breaching uh, the whistleblowing law. A uh, fine of, uh, of up to Euro 100k may be imposed there on an employer that employs 250 or more employees and has violated uh, some statutory obligations relating to internal whistleblowing system. And now for the best, Poland. Uh, Unlike in the Czech Republic or Slovakia, there is not much to report on for Poland, so don't be afraid just to sit here for another 15 minutes. Uh, although the Polish government has published draft legislation, the law has not been even submitted to the Polish parliament yet, as of today, so there is still some long way to go, and the draft law may be subject to some significant changes. Uh, in uh, its current version, there are no major deviations from the from other CE countries, uh, but as I said, uh, the outcome may still change. So we will not go into detail here and leave it for perhaps another session. Uh, that's it from my end. I think uh, I managed to somehow shorten the, the delay. So I will hand over uh, to uh, David probably just to to say goodbye and any other important thoughts. All right. Thank you, Yaroslav. Terrific job. 
Uh, thank you uh, to the presenters. Thank you to those uh, participants who stuck with us. I'm sorry that we've we've overrun a little. There is a question for Elsa in the Q and A, which obviously we're not going to do now. But I promise that within a handful of days, you will be able to find the answer to that and so much more on the Squires Employment Law blog. Do do take a look at it. Uh, just by way of reminder, if today wasn't enough just once there is a recording so you can listen to us again and you can also get hold of the recordings from our other sessions covering other western european countries and a comparison with the us uh, that's it thank you all very much for participating good afternoon <laughs>